Hello students and welcome to lecture 8 on the respiratory system. This of course is the lungs and breathing, inhaling and exhaling air. Uh, this is necessary, the air that we inhale is necessary uh, because it contains oxygen which is used as one of the reactants in something called the electron transport chain which is used to generate energy inside the mitochondria. Uh, interestingly that's that's at the uh, that's a process that's called respiration by the mitochondria. <clears throat> All right now as usual I'm going to contrast human biology to the biology of other mammals and other animals for instance and so I'm going to talk about the different types of breathers. Some animals obviously breathe air and some breathe water fish breathe water for instance and fish have a different respiratory system which is suited to extract oxygen out of the water. Um, there's also a difference between if you just look at the organisms that uh, breathe air uh, there are two types one is called a positive air breather versus a negative sorry a positive pressure breather versus a negative pressure breather. And we'll talk about the differences between negative pressure breathers and positive pressure breathers. Humans, by the way, are negative pressure breathers. Okay, and then we'll talk about the anatomy of the human respiratory system. That includes the trachea, commonly known as the windpipe, uh, the alveoli, which are the little microscopic air sacs that make up the lungs, the diaphragm, which is a layer of muscle that is located at the bottom of the uh, lungs, and you might remember that from the first or, or the third lecture, I guess, uh, that the diaphragm serves as an anatomical landmark or it's the official borderline between the thorax and the abdomen in the human body. And we had talked earlier when we talked about the musculoskeletal system, we talked about the fact that the intercostal muscles are responsible for pulling the ribs together, causing the lung, the rib cage to be pulled upwards and outwards and expanding the size of the lungs when we inhale. Okay, so we'll talk about the various parts of the human body that make up the human respiratory system. And then we will also talk about something called lung capacity or lung volume. And so people who are respiratory specialists uh, who measure the efficiency of the lungs uh, can actually measure the volume of air that's taken into the lungs and they, uh, they've broken it down into different volumes that we inhale or exhale when we breathe. So for example, we'll talk about this more later, but for example, the tidal volume of the lungs, abbreviated TV, is the ordinary volume of air that we breathe in and out every time we take a regular breath. And when we do this, <clears throat> uh, we, we leave a certain amount of volume in the lungs that is called the functional reserve, uh, so, sorry, the functional residual capacity, the FRC. And so you, you find that if you really struggle to exhale and just breathe out every last bit of air, that is pushing out what's called the functional residual capacity of the lungs. Now, if you take the, so if you do a tidal volume, you're, you'll, we'll find out later that when we do tidal breathing, tidal volume breathing, we're just uh, inhaling or exhaling a small amount of the air that's in the lungs, when in fact the amount of air that, that the, the, the actual total capacity for, for the air in the lungs is probably about six times bigger than the tidal volume. So there's a lot of air that's in our lungs at any given time, which is not actually being breathed in or breathed out. And then usually uh, I'll close off these lectures, some of these lectures on the human body systems by talking about pathologies of that particular organ system. You may recall that pathology is a branch of medicine that deals with the study of things going wrong with the human body. So I will discuss some lung pathologies at the end of this lecture, <clears throat> including something called infantile respiratory distress syndrome. Another, another illness called emphysema, which is frequently caused by smoking. Another illness called chronic bronchitis, which is caused by, uh, it's usually an inherited condition, bronchitis, meaning that the, uh, the airways that we use to breathe are constantly inflamed. 
And we will also have a very brief discussion of the way that oxygen is transported through the blood. Oxygen and carbon dioxide are transported in the blood. Oxygen, of course, is carried by hemoglobin molecules. Hemoglobin molecules are present on red blood cells. All right, let's talk about different types of breathing. So let's put the breathing system, the respiratory system that humans have into a proper context relative to other animals. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right, so water contains about 5% or 0 0.5, sorry, 0.5% oxygen. It's the oxygen that we want. The oxygen is used by the mitochondria. Do you remember from lecture four what the mitochondria are? The mitochondria are used to convert glucose into ATP. The conversion of glucose into ATP requires oxygen. Oxygen is one of the uh, reactants for that, for that process. Um, the conversion of glucose into ATP also generates carbon dioxide as a waste product. So the mitochondria, when the mitochondria are busy converting glucose into ATP, it's the ATP that is used as an energy source to power the body. The process of converting, uh, of converting glucose into ATP, exchanging glucose for ATP, is referred to as aerobic respiration. And aerobic respiration takes place in the mitochondria. In order to convert glucose into ATP, the mitochondria consume oxygen as a, as a reactant, and they produce carbon dioxide as a waste product that needs to be gotten rid of. Right, so the mitochondria are really the ones that need this oxygen that is being taken into the respiratory system. And the carbon dioxide that comes back out is a waste product of the respiratory, of, of the mitochondrial reactions, the reactions that take place in the mitochondria that needs to be gotten rid of. Okay, so in the water, we have about 0.5% oxygen in the water, as opposed to 20% of the air that we breathe on land being uh, oxygen, right? So water is approximately 0.5% uh, oxygen or less. Air is approximately 20% oxygen. So it's the oxygen that we want as a result of these percentages, it means that if you're a water breathing animal like a fish, you have to have a very efficient respiratory system, which is good at extracting all of the oxygen out of the water because there's very little oxygen there to begin with. Humans are uh, air breathers. You know, our respiratory system is not nearly as efficient as that as that of a fish or a bird, um, and because you know there's lots of oxygen in the air, we don't really need to be that efficient about extracting it. Okay, so water breathers. There's some animals that breathe water versus others that breathe air. Now, if you just look at the water breathers or the air breathers, you'll see that some of them breathe whatever it is they breathe, whether it's whether it's water or air, they, they are breathing it continuously. They're continuously passing a stream of air over their breathing surfaces, or they're continuously passing a stream of water over their breathing surfaces, versus periodic breathers like humans who suck air in, keep it for a, for a second, and then blow it back out again. That's actually rel relatively inefficient compared to having a continuous flow of fresh air or a continuous flow of fresh water over the breathing apparatus. So we'll talk about continuous breathers versus periodic breathers. Finally, we'll talk about positive pressure breathers versus negative pressure breathers. A positive pressure breather is an animal that basically gulps, uh, gulps air into its lungs and pushes air into its lungs using muscles, right? So positive pressure breathers actually push air into their lungs. As opposed to negative pressure breathers, which take the lungs and expand them to a larger volume, they stretch them to a larger volume. That has the effect of lowering, suddenly lowering the air pressure inside the lungs, which has the effect of sucking air into the lungs. So you increase the size of the lungs, which has the effect of sucking air in and then you blow that air back out by decreasing the size of the lungs. Okay, so a perfect example of a positive pressure breather would be a frog, because if you've ever seen a frog breathe, they take a mouth, 
they take a mouthful of air and they push it into their lungs. If you look at frog lungs, uh, we uh, in the laboratory we dissect some frogs so you can see the lungs inside. And those um, uh, frogs' lungs are not do not have ribs around the outside because it's actually the ribs. Part of the function of the ribs is to increase the size of the lungs in order to suck air in. So frogs' lungs don't have ribs on the outside, so they can't suck air in. The the lungs are these just they just look like little bags. Uh, they look in fact they look like little strawberries. Uh, the frogs actually have to push air into their lungs using the muscles in their mouth. That's called frog breathing. Right? Versus humans, we our lungs are surrounded by ribs, and if we pull the ribs upward with the help of the intercostal muscles, and also pull the rib cage downwards at the bottom with the help of the diaphragm, that has the effect of increasing the size of the lungs and thus pulling air in. Right, so. Mammals, most of the mammals are, in fact, all of the mammals uh, are uh, uh, negative pressure breathers. They all, all of the mammals have a rib cage which pull, which expands the size of the lungs and pulls air in. All right, so here we have a fish with its gills. And you've heard the expression that a fish has to swim or die. That's because uh, it, they actually breathe better if they're in motion. So what happens is a fish will suck air in through its mouth, either by wobbling its gills around or by simply swimming with its mouth open. And that will cause a fresh stream of water with fresh oxygen in it to, to come out through the gills. Right, so water goes into the fish's mouth and out through the gills. So fish either swim to put fresh water in their mouth or they wiggle around the, the tissue that's associated with the gills to push it in and out. You know, you've seen a fish breathe and those, those plates on the side of its head are constantly waving around. That's to, to move air, uh, to move water over the gills. So the gills are an example of a continuous uh, flow water breathing respiratory system. So there's a continuous flow of fresh water containing fresh oxygen over the gills at all times. And so fish are a water breather. Uh, they have to they have this very efficient system and having a continuous flow sit breathing system is actually much more efficient than a than a periodic flow. Birds are continuous flow air breathers. So they breathe air and in fact, they have they have a set of lungs, and then they have two sets. They have two air sacs. They have an anterior air sac and a posterior air sac. And what they do is they inhale air into the posterior air sac, and then they blow it continuously over the lung tissue, and then into the anterior air sac. So they're not continuously filling the lungs with air and then pushing the air back out, filling up and pushing out, filling up and emptying the way humans are. They don't do that. They, they manipulate these two air sacs, the anterior and the posterior air sac, in such a way that there's a continuous flow of air containing fresh oxygen over the lung tissue. The lung tissues are called parabronchies, parabronchi. And uh, we'll talk about bronchi later when we talk about the human respiratory system. But so humans have what are known as bronchi or bronchial tubes. And birds have something called parabronchi in their lungs, which are basically just grooves or folds in the lungs that are meant to have air continuously passing over the lungs. So I don't have to tell you that birds are very energetic animals. And the reason they're so energetic is because they're able to extract a lot of oxygen from their uh, uh, from the air by using a continuous flow breathing system. Another reason why birds are energetic is because uh, the blood system carries hemoglobin inside red blood cells. In human in humans, for reasons we don't understand, in humans and other mammals like humans that includes tigers, horses, uh, sheep, rabbits, and so on, in other mammal humans and all the other mammals, the red blood cells that have the hemoglobin on the inside are actually dead. They are produced in the bone marrow through the process called hematopoiesis. You remember that word. So the, the, the red blood cells in mammals are produced in the red bone marrow, the, the, the spongy bone through a process called hematopoiesis. 
And those blood cells, as soon as they're created, they die. The nucleus disappears. The nucleus containing the genes essentially dissolves. And the central part of the blood cell collapses, which is why it has a kind of a donut shape. So a red blood cell in a mammal is flat, not round. And as, as such, because it's dead, it's a dead cell that's full of hemoglobin. That dead cell will will circulate around the body for about 120 days before it's eventually before it eventually breaks down and and is dissolved in a in an organ called the spleen. Okay, so the the red blood cells in mammals, including humans, have a finite lifespan because they're dead to begin with. In birds, the red blood cells are alive. They have a nucleus, and so they last a lot longer. So there are two reasons why a bird is much more energetic than a human. One reason is because they have uh, continuous flow breathing apparatus, and another reason is because they have uh, live erythrocytes. Erythrocytes is the technical term for a red blood cell. Okay, so here we have a frog that is a positive air, a pro positive pressure breather. It sucks a mouthful of water, a mouthful of air into its mouth. And then it pushes, using the muscles in its mouth, it pushes that air into the lungs. The lungs are not surrounded by a rib cage. They're just little balloons that are blown up thanks to the positive air pressure in the frog's mouth. Humans are negative, uh, are negative air pressure breathers. So what we do is when we, take an, when we take an inhale, when we inhale some air, the intercostal muscles will pull the, rib the ribs of the rib cage up and out and simultaneously the diaphragm will pull the bottom of the rib cage down and that process of pulling the rib cage, the ribs up and out while the diaphragm pulls downward this has the effect of increasing the size of the lungs and that sucks air in that's called creating negative pressure in the lungs in order to suck air in right so humans are negative pressure breathers frogs are positive pressure breathers all right, let's look at the various parts of the human respiratory system. Okay, so we have the nasal cavity, that's the space behind the nose. We have the pharynx, which is basically the space behind the nose and the mouth. That is sometimes referred to as the nasopharynx. The nasopharynx collectively refers to the space at the back of the mouth, as well as the space at behind the nose, the sinus cavities behind the nose. Right, and then we have the larynx, which is the uh, basically the Adam's apple, commonly called the Adam's apple. That's the lumpy part at the top of your neck. That's the larynx. Contained within the larynx, we have the epiglottis. That's that flap of tissue that we learned about during the digestive system. The epiglottis closes off the top of the trachea when we take when we swallow food so that the food doesn't end up going down into our lungs. Right? And then we have the trachea, which is commonly called the windpipe. Uh, the trachea is made of columnar epithelial tissue, uh, which is surrounded on the outside with rings of cartilage that prevent the windpipe from collapsing. Right, so you know that if you had a if you had a rubber hose, a, a soft rubber hose, and you tried to suck air through that rubber hose, the rubber hose would simply collapse. Right? Rather than rather than having the air come through, the rubber hose would simply collapse. And the same thing would be true of the trachea, if not for the fact that we have rings of cartilage surrounding the outside of the trachea to hold it in shape. All right, now the trachea is surrounded on the inside with what are called ciliated columnar epithelium. So it, again, it is epithelial tissue. The, uh, uh, these are epithelial tissue in the shape of columns. And ciliated cilia are little tiny motorized fingers, microscopic motorized fingers that are able to move things around on the inside the surface of the trachea. Okay, there are also some cells in the trachea. I, I won't ask you about these, but they're called goblet cells. The goblet cells produce uh, mucus, and we know what mucus is at this point. So the inside of the trachea has goblet cells. The goblet cells produce mucus, and so the inside of the trachea is covered with a thin layer of mucus. It's, uh, we learned in the last lecture that the inside of the stomach is covered with a thick layer of mucus, and the purpose of that thick layer of mucus is to protect the stomach from being burned by its own acid. The trachea is lined with a thin layer of mucus. The purpose of this thin layer of mucus is to catch and trap 
dust particles and bacteria and fungus and pollen and things like that, trap it in this mucus, this sticky layer of mucus, and prevent it from getting into the lungs. Okay, so what do you do with these particles once they've been trapped in the mucus inside the trachea? Well, the motorized fingers, the cilia, will propel this mucus that's contaminated with all this stuff upwards into the mouth so that you can uh, cough it out or swallow it. So that's the purpose of mucus inside the trachea, and that's the purpose of ciliated columnar epithelium lining the trachea. All right, so the trachea goes down the center of your chest and then it bifurcates. The word bifurcate means it divides in two. So it bifurcates into two primary bronchi. A primary bronchus, so you start out with one tube, the trachea, and then you divide it in two to create two primary bronchii. And then each of those primary bronchii divide up into a number of secondary and tertiary bronchi. Now from this, you may have guessed that the term primary means one or number one. Secondary means two or more. Tertiary means another yet another division, right? So if you, you have the primary, that's the top level of organization. Secondary is the secondary layer, you know, secondary level of organization. Tertiary refers to a, a third, yet a third level of organization. So we start out with the trachea. Trachea bifurcates into two primary bronchi. Each of those primary bronchi divide up further into smaller branches that are called the secondary bronchi. And then the ter tertiary bronchi, I, I circled the wrong thing there, the tertiary bronchi. If you divide the secondary bronchi up into multiple branches, those are each called tertiary bronchi. And then finally, you have a structure called terminal bronchioles. And on the end of terminal bronchioles, you have alveolar sacs, which are called alveoli, alveolae. Right? So alveolar, alveolus or alveoli, alveolae are little tiny balloons, microscopic balloons that are about 0 0.2 uh, millimeters in diameter. <clears throat> so they're you know, only about one quarter the size of a millimeter. So they're, eh, they're barely big enough to see with the human eye. They're sort of on the borderline between being able to see them with the human eye or not. All right, now these alveoli are made of two types of squamous epithelium. So I mentioned earlier on when we talked about tissues, I mentioned that squamous epithelia are flattened epithelial cells. They're kind of flattened into the shape of a dinner plate, into a dish shape. And they're very thin. And, and so anywhere in the body that you need a very thin tissue, it's probably squamous cell epithelium, simple squamous cell epithelium, meaning that there's only one layer. So uh, the alveolar sacs, the alveoli, are made of a single layer of simple squamous epithelium. Now the, the epithelial, the squamous epithelial cells that make up the, alveoli, the walls of the alveoli are classified as either type 1 or type 2, and we'll talk about what that means in a minute. All right, so we mentioned the fact that the human respiratory system, the lungs expand with the help of the intercostal muscles that pull the rib cage upward and the diaphragm that pulls the diaphragm downwards simultaneously, and th that um, movement is controlled by the brain. So there are two sets of nerves that come from the brain in order to control these movements. There is a set of nerves called the phrenic nerves that power the diaphragm, that control the diaphragm. So the phrenic nerves come from the brain down to the diaphragm and cause the diaphragm to contract and therefore push, pull downwards rather. Okay, so the word, another word here, the word phrenic refers to the diaphragm. Right. If you, it won't really that knowing that will not really help you in this course. But if you take Biology 130, you'll know that there are there's a set of phrenic arteries and a set of phrenic veins. And what do you think they do? They supply blood to the diaphragm. Right. So the word phrenic refers to the diaphragm. Okay. Then the intercostal muscles. The word costal. I think I mentioned before. The word costal refers to the ribs. Right, so you have costal cartilage, that's the, that's the cartilage that connects the ribs to the sternum. And you have intercostal muscles. The intercostal muscles are muscles that are found in between the ribs. 
and they are controlled from the brain using a set of nerves called the intercostal nerves. Right? So the breathing, human breathing is controlled by two sets of nerves called the phrenic nerves and the intercostal nerves. Okay, so we know that the larynx is that lumpy part in the, in the upper part of your throat. And within the larynx, if you look behind the larynx, you have the epiglottis. So the epiglottis is actually located at the top of the, of the larynx. So the epiglottis closes off the top of the trachea. The trachea is uh, uh, the tube that leads to the lungs. It's lined by rings of cartilage on the outside to prevent the trachea from collapsing under negative air pressure. The trachea has ciliated columnar epithelium on the inside. It has goblet cells that produce mucus. Goblet cells produce mucus. The sticky layer of mucus is inside the trachea in order to trap dust and pollen and other things that might otherwise get into the lungs. Once those things are trapped inside the layer of mucus, they are propelled upwards to the top of the trachea by the cilia that are connected to the ciliated columnar epithelium. And that allows you to cough the, the dirty mucus up into your mouth and either cough it up or swallow it. Okay, now here's something. Squamous cell metaplasia is one of the pathologies that can happen to the trachea if you smoke cigarettes. Do not, please do not smoke cigarettes because it's a very bad habit. Uh, it's a very dangerous to your health. Um, it's harder to stop. If you smoke already, you'll know that it's very hard to stop because tobacco is addictive. It's an addictive drug. And the people who, who manufacture tobacco and sell it to you as cigarettes, they are making money off of people's misery and they know perfectly well that it's an addicted drug, addictive drug. They just refuse to admit it in public. However, uh, so cigarette smoking is very bad because it causes lung cancer. We, we know that for a fact, it's not a theory. It causes lung cancer. And uh, another thing that cigarette smoking causes is something called squamous cell metaplasia. The word plasia, the word plasia means uh, refers to the pattern of growth of cells and meta means beyond or a change in right so metaplasia means a change in the shape of these cells so you know that the trachea is lined with columnar epithelium if you inhale hot smoke every day those uh, columnar epithelium will get damaged to the point where they kind of squish down into the shape of a squamous cell right so if you have if you look at the uh, at the cells that line the trachea of a person and their columnar, their co column shaped, you can assume that person is not a smoker. But if you look at the cells of somebody and you see that they, they now have squamous cells lining their trachea instead of columnar cells, that is called squamous cell metaplasia. And you know that those cells were converted from columnar cells to squamous cells by constant exposure to hot gas. Right, so that is one of the pathologies of lungs. One of the pathologies of the respiratory system is called squamous cell metaplasia. I might ask you about this on a test. What, it, what is it? Can you explain what it is and what causes it? So squamous cell metaplasia is the conversion of the ciliated columnar epithelia in the trachea into squamous cells due to constant exposure to a hot smoke. Okay, so as I said, why, do, why does the trachea have rings of cartilage around the outside for exactly the same reason that the vac that a vacuum cleaner hose has uh, kind of a springs metal springs on the inside to keep it from collapsing under negative air pressure so the trachea bifurcates into two primary bronchi bifurcation specifically refers to splitting in two you uh, you wouldn't normally use the word bifurcate if you're talking about splitting into three or four. Bifurcate contains the word by, so bifurcate. Okay, then the, each of those primary bronchi branches out into several tertiary, uh, secondary bronchi. Each of the secondary bronchi uh, branch out into several tertiary bronchi. And at the end of each of those tertiary bronchi, you have a structure called a terminal bronchiole. And at the ends of the terminal bronchioles, you have the alveoli alveoli so these little balloon sacs okay now the 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 term ventilation refers to moving air in and out of the lungs 
And now somebody, sometimes you may have, you may know somebody who has, if you go to the hospital and you're injured very badly or something, you may have, you may lose the ability to breathe on your own. So you have to breathe with a machine called a ventilator. So a ventilator is a machine that pushes air in and out of your lungs for you. That's what a ventilator is. So the process of moving air in and out of your lungs is called ventilation. The process of moving blood through the lung tissue in order to get aerated, in order to pick up fresh oxy oxygen, that is called perfusion. So perfusion is the process of moving blood through the body in general, but specifically through the lung tissue in order to get fresh oxygen. So ventilation and perfusion are the same thing. Now here's a little tip for you if you're interested in a career in, uh, in, uh, in, as a medical laboratory technician or some kind of a technician that works in a hospital. If you want to become a doctor, that's fine. If you like working in hospitals and you like working with patients, that's fine. You can become a doctor, but you have to be prepared for the fact that that takes you about 15 years from the time you graduated high school. It may take you you generally spend four years to get a bachelor of science degree and then you get into medical school you spend four more and then depending on what type of medicine you want to specialize in you have to spend some several years as a resident working in a hospital if you want to be a surgeon for instance that's a seven-year residency right so from the time you graduate high school to the time you can officially be a surgeon is about is about 17 years or sorry about 15 years so that's a long time but if you like working with patients and you like working in hospitals, there are other jobs you can do. There are other careers you can you can have. And one of those other careers, you would have to go to uh, the BC Technical Institute in, Can in BC, which is called the British Columbia Institute of Technology. You, you finish here at Columbia, get your AD degree, and then you spend two years at BCIT and you get a diploma called, which certifies you to, uh, you are something called a perfusion technician. So this is a job that you can have, which is a very nice career if, you know, it's, uh, it doesn't take you anywhere near as long as it takes to become a doctor and you get, you, you don't get paid bad money. You probably get paid about half as much or two thirds as much as a doctor does anyway. And you can practice that job for 15 or 20 years longer than a doctor normally practices their job. So over your lifetime, you probably end up making more money than a doctor does anyway. So a perfusion technician is somebody that when, when the surgeon goes into the operating theater, the perfusion technician hooks the patient up to a machine called a perfusion machine, uh, called a heart and lung machine actually, that, that moves air in and out of the lungs and circulates the blood around. Uh, that's especially true when they're doing uh, cardiac surgery, when they're doing, when they're operating on the heart. So the doctor does all the operating on the heart, but the perfusion technician hooks up the patient to the heart and lung machine and monitors the heart and lung machine. The person who does that is called a perfusion technician. That's a two-year program, which you can you can get the qualifications to be a perfusion technician fairly quickly. And it's a, it's a very secure job. You're allowed hospitals all over the world hire perfusion technicians to run their heart and lung machine. So uh, I recommend that as a career to anybody who's, who is interested in medicine but doesn't want to spend 15 years or so becoming a doctor. All right, so perfusion and ventilation. Ventilation refers to moving air in and out of the lungs, and a ventilator is a machine that does that. And perfusion is the process of moving blood through the body, but also mainly through the lungs in order to get the fresh oxygen. Okay, so in order to get fresh air into the lungs, the diaphragm pulls the, the lungs downwards, controlled by the phrenic nerve, and the intercostal muscles pull the ribs upwards and outwards, controlled by the intercostal nerves. That pulls air into the lungs. Okay, how does the lung get back out? How does the air get back out of the lungs? Quite easy. The lungs are made of tissues. The, the tissues that form the, the, the uh, lung alveoli are surrounded by little tiny blood vessels called capillaries that carry the, you know, that pick up the oxygen or either pick up the new oxygen or deliver the carbon dioxide to go back out of the lungs. But the lung tissue itself, the squamous cell epithelia that make up the lungs are filled with a lot of elastin the protein elastin. So they have elastic properties. Elastic properties means that they stretch and then they recoil. Right? So if you stretch an elastic band and you let go of it, it returns to its normal shape. That's called recoil. The same thing is true of a rubber balloon. So if you blow up a rubber balloon, you notice that it takes a certain amount of energy to push the air into the balloon. But then when you let go of the neck of the balloon, it just 
sputters all over the place because it's returning to its normal shape spontaneously. Okay, so the the pulling the diaphragm down and the ribs up will stretch and increase the size of the lungs, but when those muscles release, the air is just pushed back out automatically the way it would come back out of a rubber balloon, thanks to the property of elastic recoil. All right, so here we have the lungs. So here's the this is the larynx here, the commonly called the Adam's apple. The larynx is, uh, sorry, the uh, uh, epiglottis is located right above it. So if that's closed, the, the trachea is closed. Here's the trachea with the rings of cartilage on the outside. It bifurcates into two primary bronchi. The bronchi then divide up into secondary and tertiary bronchi, and eventually they terminate in terminal bronchioles, these things here, and then at the end of each terminal bronchiole, you have an alveolar air sac. These alveolar air sacs have little tiny thin blood vessels on the outside. Those little tiny thin blood vessels are called capillaries. The the alveoli are made of a single layer of simple squamous epithelium, which means that, that oxygen can easily cross the single layer of simple squamous epithelium in order to get into the capillaries. And the carbon dioxide that's being carried away uh, that you're trying to get rid of, the carbon dioxide is made of... Uh, uh, the carbon dioxide is carried in the blood and it is easy for that uh, carbon dioxide to get out of the capillaries and into the alveoli in order to get out of the body because the the uh, alveoli are made of little thin squamous cell epithelia cells. Okay, so here we have the trachea again with the, the, the sorry, the we have the larynx with the epiglottis on top up here at the top. Then we have the rings of cartilage, the two primary bronchioles, uh, tr primary bronchi and then you have secondary and tertiary bronchi and so on. Once again the rings of cartilage are there for the same reason that you have plastic rings that are reinforcing a vacuum cleaner hose to prevent it from collapsing under negative air pressure. This is a scanning electron microscope image showing the cilia on the surface of the uh, ciliated columnar epithelia on the inside of the trachea. Right, so these are, the, these are the little motorized fingers that catch the mucus, and the mucus catches the dirt and, and microbes that are trying to get into the lungs, and then these little microscopic cilia, these motorized fingers, will move the, the mucus upwards in the trachea until you can cough it out into your mouth and either spit it out or swallow it. Okay, so the diaphragm pulls the lungs down in order to increase the volume and the intercostal, as I said, the word costal refers to the ribs. The intercostal muscles are the muscles in between the ribs, of course, therefore they're called intercostal muscles. And they pull the, they pull the rib cage upwards and outwards, which has the effect of increasing the lung volume and creating negative pressure again. Okay, so the phrenic nerve controls the diaphragm, the intercostal nerves control the intercostal muscles. Right, so here, increasing the size of the lungs in order to suck air in. And then when you relax the intercostal muscles again and you relax the diaphragm again, the air goes out spontaneously due to elastic recoil. Okay, how big are the alveoli? They are approximately 200 micrometers or 200 microns across, 200 microns in diameter. Remember that there are a thousand micron, there are a thousand micrometers in a millimeter, right? So that means that each alveoli is about 0 0.2 millimeters in diameter, which is sort of on the borderline between you can't you, you can't really see that with the naked eye, but you can see it with a dissecting microscope under low magnification. You can see it quite easily under that. Uh, so you could basically fit 200 regular cells end to end in order to cross w from one side of an alveoli to the other. Now these squamous cell epithelia that make up the, the alveoli are divided into two categories based on function. The type one cells are squamous cell epithelia that don't actually produce anything. They're just there for structural support. They make up the structure of the alveoli. But about one out of every five of those, about one out of every five of those squamous cell epithelia is classified as a type two cell, which produces a fluid called surfactant. Right. Surfactant is a, it's a liquid that contains a little bit of protein and it prevents the walls of the alveoli from sticking together. Right? So the, the, 
the 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 inside of the alveoli is moist because of water vapor and if you've ever blown up a balloon let's say you were playing in a swimming pool or something like that i don't know if you ever, i don't know if you ever did this as a child playing with balloons while you're in the in a swimming pool or something like that you know that when you get the inside of the balloon wet the the rubber walls of the balloon will stick together and it's hard to get them apart it's hard to blow the balloon up again if it's if it's wet on the inside and the walls are stuck together but if you put a little bit of soap into that water inside the balloon that will lower the what's what's called you know the the surface pressure that's holding the walls together will dissipate and then you can blow it up again more easily right so the surfactant prevents the walls of the alveoli from sticking together by adding a little bit of uh, protein rich liquid to this area right? now this is important because every now and then when you exhale the, the the alveoli shrink you know because of elastic recoil and every now and then the walls will get stuck together and if the walls are stuck together it becomes harder to reinflate the alveoli and that's what the surfactant is for it prevents the walls of the alveoli from sticking together and it becomes much easier to reinflate the alveolar sac once you have the surfactant in there all right now if you if you exhale and some of the and the uh the alveoli walls get stuck together and you have trouble getting them back apart that is technically called atelectasis atelectasis the common term for that is a collapsed lung. That means too much air goes out of the lung. The, a lot of the alveoli will collapse and stuck, get stuck together, and then you have trouble reinflating the lung. That is commonly called a collapsed lung. The technical term for that is atelectasis. Okay, now here's something that you need to know. This is one of the pathologies for, this, for the respiratory system that I could ask you about on tests. It turns out that when we are developing in our mother's womb, when a fetus is developing in its mother's womb, the type two cells that produce the surfactants in the alveoli will not start working until seven months of development, 26 weeks, All right? So that you know that a baby is born after nine months. What happens to a premature baby that's born after seven months or earlier than seven months? That means that if the baby comes out before seven months of age, you have a premature birth. The baby comes out early. The baby is in, uh, if the baby comes out before seven months, it is in danger of having atelectasis because its lungs haven't produced, the type two cells in its lungs have not yet produced the surfactant, right? So premature babies are, are in danger of something called infantile respiratory distress syndrome abbreviated IRDS right so IRDS is where you have a premature baby that's born earlier than seven months their type 2 cells have not yet produced surfactant so they have trouble they are in danger if they have a lung collapse that could kill them right so there are two things that you would do in that case to prevent IR, IRDS one is you they do make an artificial surfactant, which you can spray into the baby's lungs as it's breathing, right? So it's an artificial spray. And you can also put the baby on, what did I call that machine that helps you to breathe again? What do you call that machine? A ventilator, right? So you can put the baby on a ventilator and also spray some artificial uh, surfactant into its lungs until its, its own type two cells start making surfactant. Okay, so here you see one of the, this is a cross section and a bright, bright field microscope image showing that uh, you can see individual cells here in the alveoli. This is a cross section cut through uh, the, uh, the transverse plane of an alveoli, right? So this is one of the air sacs and you could fit 20 cells from side to side, right? So this is about 0 0.2 millimeters. And <clears throat> these, most of these cells that are making up the alveoli are type one cells but every now and then you'll run into a type two cell whose job it is to make the surfactant. If you have a premature baby that's born before seven months of age, you have to put the baby generally on a ventilator because you don't wanna have any possibility of, the, of too much air. Uh, you know, a mechanical ventilator pushes the air into the lungs with a good strong push as opposed to the baby's lungs, which may or may not be sucking the air in very strongly. But the ventilator pushes the air in with a good strong push every time. And so that kind of 
prevents the possibility that you might have a lung collapse, lungs collapse atelectasis. So that, so the danger of that, uh, that syndrome where the baby's lungs collapse because its type two cells are not making surfactant, that is actually called infantile res respiratory distress syndrome. Okay, be aware of the fact that the two lungs are not identical. They're not symmetrical. So whenever you take an organ and you divide that organ into pieces, uh, if, if an organ is naturally divided into pieces, we call the multiple pieces lobes, right? So lobes. Okay, now if you take all the air that gets into the lungs and you call that total amount 100%, the right lung is actually larger than the left lung. It is composed of three lobes and the right lung contains 55% of the lung capacity, 55% of the air that you bring in. The left, lo the left lung is a little bit smaller. It's composed of two lobes that contain 45% of the air that you breathe. And the reason why the left lung is smaller than the right lung is because the heart, the apex or the bottom part of the heart has to fit into a little indentation, a little dent in the left lung. So here we are, the, the right lung contains 55% of the inhaled air. It's composed of three lobes, right? There's a superior lobe and there's an inferior lobe and then there's a, there's a medial lobe, right? And then the left lung has this dent in it to accommodate the heart. And the left lung is composed of two, lo the left lung is just composed of two, lo two lobes, the superior lobe and the inferior lobe. So the two lobes of the, the two lungs are not the same. The right lung brings in a little bit more air than the left lung and is composed of three, three, layer, uh, three lobes rather. All right, now the lungs are located in the thorax, in the thoracic cavity, and they are surrounded by membranes called pleura, right? So the pleural membrane, the pleural membrane, pleura is, is uh, is, is plural, uh, but plur, plural membrane refers to the layer of tissue, a membrane of tissue that surrounds the lungs. Okay, now it's a double membrane. The plural, plural membrane that surrounds the lung, lungs is a double membrane surrounding the lungs. There's an inner layer and an outer layer, right? The inner layer is called the visceral pleura and the outer layer is called the parietal pleura. Right? And there's a layer of lubricant, lubricating liquid in between. Okay, so why do we have lubricant? Well, if we didn't have that, if we didn't have the pleural membrane with the pleural fluid in between, the, the, the lungs would be constantly filling up and emptying out, filling out and emptying up, and they would be rubbing against the ribs but they don't rub against the ribs. Rubbing against the ribs would create friction and eventually damage. But instead we want a little bit of lubricant to, so that the, the movement over, constant movement back and forth across the ribs doesn't cause damage to the lung tissue. And that's what the, that's what the pleura are for. That's what the pleural membrane is for. Okay, so you can see the pleural membrane. There are two of them. The outer one is called the parietal pleura. The inner one is called the visceral pleura. Right? And then the interpleural space contains the lubricating fluid. And so we, we can actually prevent the, the uh, lungs from directly rubbing against the ribs every time the intercostal muscles contract. All right, now there are two problems. Let's move on and discuss some more pathology. There are two problems that you could have with the lungs. You could get fluid accumulating inside the lungs, which makes it hard to breathe. And when that happens, that's called pulmonary edema. Now here's another word that you need to know. The word pulmonary, pulmonary means, refers to the breathing system, the lungs, right? Refers to the lungs. Uh, when I first graduated with my Bachelor of Science degree, uh, how long ago was that? More than 30 years ago. I The first job I got was a job as a research technician at St. Paul's Hospital, where I was hired by a, a research unit called the Pulmonary Research Unit. And at the, when I got that job, I had no idea what pulmonary meant. And I soon got into that lab and realized that they were doing research on lungs. So that's what pulmonary means. Right, so now you know something in first year that I didn't know even after I'd finished fourth year for the first time. 
Okay, so pulmonary edema, pulmon the word pulmonary refers to the lungs, right? And then cardiopulmonary refers to the heart and the lungs. Okay, so pulmonary, the word pulmonary refers to the lungs. The word edema means swelling due to the due to absorption of fluid, right? So pulmonary edema is where you get swelling of tissues that causes fluid to seep into the lungs due to osmosis, which makes it difficult to breathe. Um, when we get to the section on the cardiovascular system, I'll tell you some of the possible causes of pulmonary edema. But for now, just remember that pulmonary edema is accumulation of fluid, uh, seeping of fluid into the alveoli of the lungs. And if you seep, if you have liquid filling up the lungs, that reduces the amount of space you have for the air to come in. And so that makes it hard to breathe, obviously. Okay, there's another thing that can go wrong with the lungs, which is called pleural effusions. So plural means the plural membrane. It refers to the plural membranes. And this is where you have fluid outside the lungs within the pleura. Right. So again, you can't breathe because the, the space that the, 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 the amount of space that the lungs have to expand has been reduced. Right. So there's fluid outside the lungs. In, it's, in, it's within the thorax, but it's outside the lungs. But that doesn't matter because this fluid is taking up space and that prevents your lungs from being able to inflate to their full size. OK, so here is plural effusions. There's fluid between within the pleural space, often between the, the layers, between the parietal and the visceral layers of the pleural membrane, right? So that's called pleural effusions. Uh, if you get this, there's nothing you can do except that if you go to the hospital, they'll poke a hole with a pin and suck the fluid out, right? So they'll, 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 uh, uh, they'll, they'll simply suck the fluid out with a syringe, with a needle. Okay, now let's let's talk about how much air you can fit into the lungs. That's important because that's referred to as the lung capacity. Okay, I already mentioned the fact that inhalation is where you suck air in. The technical term for in, inhalation is inspiration, right? So I could ask you, you know, I, I could ask you a question, what's the technical word for inhalation? And you would say inspiration. And then when you blow the air back out, due to elastic recoil, that's called exhalation, but the technical word is expiration, right? Expiration, okay, and it happens due to elastic recoil. That means the balloon is just returning to its original shape because it's made out of elastic tissues, okay? Now, the fact that air is pushed out of the lungs due to elastic recoil is critical when we talk about a disease called emphysema. Emphysema is a disease that's commonly caused by smoking if you inhale this cigarette smoke every day, it has the effect of damaging the lung tissue so that it's not elastic anymore. If it's not elastic anymore, when you go to exhale, the air doesn't go out, right? So you've had a, you know what it's like when you blow up a brand new balloon that's very rubbery and pliant, the air goes, you blow it up, you let go of it and all the air comes out. If it's an old brittle balloon, you blow the air into it and when you let go only half of the air comes back out because the tissue the the rubber of the rubber that makes up the balloon is not as pliant anymore it's not as stretchy anymore and that essentially is what emphysema is you the, your lung capacity is greatly reduced not because you've lost the ability to inhale it's reduced because you've lost the ability to exhale or you've lost most of the ability to exhale right and that is something that's caused by smoking uh, we know this for a fact. All right, so now I told you that ventilation refers to circulating air through the lungs and you use a machine called a ventilator to do that. Perfusion means moving the blood through the capillaries, the little blood vessels that surround the alveoli. And I mentioned the fact that if you can operate these machines, a perfusion and ventilation machine, you can be a perfusion technician. That's a two-year program at British Columbia Institute of Technology. Okay, now we have numbers associated with each of the different types of volumes associated with the lungs. So when, you just, when you're just breathing normally, the amount of air that goes in and out of your lungs with every normal breath is referred to as the tidal volume, right? So that's a definition. I could ask you about that on a test. That's the regular in and out motion. Uh, it depends on how big the person is and how big their thorax is, but uh, it's generally about half a liter 
right? That's not very much. The capacity of human lungs is usually more like about four liters. So, you know, we're only talking about 25% of the total volume of the lungs going in and out with each breath. So the air that's in there is constantly being mixed with new air, but it's rare that we suck in entirely new air and it's rare that we blow out entirely old air. Okay, now when you take, when you exhale with a regular tidal volume breath, when you exhale, the amount of air that's left in the lungs is called the functional residual capacity. Residual, residual means what's left over. Residual means what's left over. Okay, so the functional residual capacity, the FRC, is what would be left after you exhale normally. So, you know, when you you try, you use all of the muscles in your stomach and your and your body to push every last little bit of air out. That would be called uh, the air that comes out after you've tried everything you can to exhale as far and as forcefully as you possibly can. That's expiration. Okay, so you force all of the air out of your lungs. How much is left after you do that? There's There's still air in there. You can't possibly get it all out. Right, that's called the expiratory re reserve volume. So after you've pushed all of the air, if you push all of the air out of your lungs as you possibly can, you're left with something called the expiratory reserve volume. That's depending on the size of the person. Again, that's usually around 1.2 liters that you can never get out. Okay, let's say on the other hand, you take a, you take a regular breath, you've got more room to go. You have more room to go. So if you inhale as deeply as you possibly can and get the maximum amount of air into your lungs as you can, that's called the inspiratory reserve volume, the IRV. And that's usually around 3.1 lungs. So you have, you can blow, you know, you normally exhale 0 0.5 liters. If you really push, you can get another 1.2 liters out. If you inhale, uh, if you inhale normally, and then you do everything you can to suck more air in, you can usually suck in about another three liters. And regardless of what you do, there's nothing, there's nothing that you can do to blow the remaining air out. That would be called the residual volume, right? So the functional residual capacity is what's left after a normal exhalation. If you push as much air out of your lungs as you possibly can, that's the residual volume. Right. Expiratory reserve volume, right? And so how much is left after you've pushed all of the expiratory reserve volume out is the residual volume about 1.2 liters. All right, vital lung capacity. The word vital means life. So what is the, basically it's, what is the maximum, if you take the deepest possible breath you can and then blow as much of it out as you possibly can and you measure that, that is called the vital capacity of the lung, the VC. And if we were doing this, if we were doing this class, if we were doing this uh, course in the building in Columbia College, you would all get to measure the, vi the vital capacity of your lungs using a machine called a spirometer that we have in the lab. Uh, generally, for most people, if you inhale the deepest breath you possibly can, for myself, for instance, uh, I, what, if I inhale the deepest breath I possibly can get, and I blow it out for as long as hard and as hard as I can into the spirometer machine. The spirometer machine says that I have I have about 4.5 liters in total vi vital capacity, vital lung capacity. Okay, so the vital capacity is classified as the maximum amount you inhale and then push it out as far as you can. That functionally is the tidal volume plus the expiratory reserve plus the plus the inspiratory reserve, right? So you suck in as much as you can including that from a regular breath plus a forced inhalation. And then you blow it out as hard as you can for as long as you can using forced expiration. So the tidal volume plus the expiratory reserve volume plus the in, inspiratory reserve volume in total gives you the, the vital, uh, gives you a number called the vital capacity of the lungs. Uh, that vital capacity normally varies between men and women um, I uh, generally men have a, have a vital capacity of around four liters. Women have a vital capacity of around 2.8 or three liters. It depends. Uh, every year when we do this this lab in class, we get the whole class to blow into the spirometer, and then we we divide the class up between males and females and see what the average vital capacity is for males versus females. Uh, 
But it's it's kind of interesting because uh, you would think that like normally if you look at opera singers, opera singers have a great big thorax. Like somebody like Luciano Pavarotti, the famous opera singer, had a big barrel chest. They call it a barrel chest because it's like a barrel. And of course, they have a very large lung capacity because they sing opera. They spend all day singing. Um, um, you you may know Sarah. Doc, uh, uh, Dr. Gomeshi Nobari, Sarah Gomeshi Nobari, is an opera singer as well, and she she has a big chest because she's always singing the big notes in the opera. But uh, so men generally have a bigger chest than women, a bigger have a bigger vital capacity. And so one year, normally when we do this, when we do the uh, we do the vital capacity measurements in the lab, the the women usually have an average of about 2.8. But there was one year that I had a small, there was a small girl in the lab. She was tall, but she had a very small chest. And she did the, she did the VC test and she, she had like 4.8 liters vital capacity. I was, I was amazed. So that even though the fact that she was on the small side, she could still suck that much air into her lungs and then blow that much back out again. She had this amazing reserve capacity that was bigger than most of the men. And I asked her, I think I asked her if she was an athlete, like if she was a runner or if she was an opera singer. And she said, no, she didn't do either of those things. So she, I think she was wasting the opportunity. She could have been a famous opera singer with a lung capacity like that. Okay, let's talk about a little bit more lung capacities, lung pathologies rather. Okay, so we talked about infantile respiratory distress syndrome. This is something that happens to premature babies whose type two cells are not making surfactant yet. Chronic bronchitis is some, is a generally it's a genetic condition that that is caused by uh, genetic problems with uh, uh, it's 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 often a, a chronic immune system problem. So the uh, the immune system gets overactive in the bronchial tubes and is constantly irritated because it thinks it's constantly fighting off an infection. So the bronchial tubes when you're fighting off an infection, as you know, when you catch a cold, you get a cough because your your bronchial tubes and your trachea are producing more mucus than they otherwise would in an effort to trap the cold viruses and get rid of them. Right. So when you get when you get an, a, a respiratory, a respiratory system infection like a cold, a chest cold or the flu, the the uh, goblet cells in your bronchi and trachea will produce more mucus in order to try and trap these microbes that are causing the infection so you can get rid of them. All right, so somebody who has chronic bronchitis, is const their bronchi, bronchi are constantly inflamed and producing excess mucus, right? And so somebody with chronic bronchitis is constantly coughing and uh, they, they sometimes wear a vibrating vest at night when they go to sleep and that vest vibrates their chest to try and shake loose the mucus so they can cough it up and swallow it or spit it out. So that's chronic bronchitis. I should mention, by the way, this is something that, that you'll need to know. The, the suffix itis means inflammation. Inflammation means that something swells up and becomes irritated and swells up and turns red and hurts. Right, so that's irritation, right? That's, uh, you know, in, that is technically called inflammation. Inflammation, <clears throat> inflammation is when some part of the body swells up and turns red and hurts and feels hot. That together, those four things together are called inflammation. And if, it's, if you want to describe the condition where a certain body part is inflamed, you take the name of that body part and you add itis to the end. Right, so bronchitis is inflammation of the bronchial tubes. Right, now, I'll tell you that the, the membranes that surround the brain are called the meninges. So what do you call it when the membranes that surround the brain become inflamed? What would be your guess? That is called meningitis, right? The meninges become inflamed. That condition is called meningitis. All right, you know that you have an appendix. If the appendix becomes inflamed, what do you call it? 
if you guessed appendix itis appendix itis you would be correct except that that's it's usually pronounced appendicitis right so itis uh, uh itis if if you take the name of an organ and you put itis on the end it means that that particular organ is inflamed and that's how you that's how you derive the name for that condition okay so that's chronic bronchitis and then emphysema as i said is caused by cigarette smoke the hot cigarette smoke destroys the elasticity of the the walls of the alveoli if you have less elastic recoil, that means you end up having a bigger functional reserve capacity, a bigger functional reserve or a, a bigger resi residual uh, residual. So the, the residual amount of stale air that stays in the lungs when you try to inhale becomes much larger when you have emphysema. So you can't get the old stale carbon dioxide enriched air out of the lungs in order to replace it with new uh, fresh air that contains oxygen, which means that uh, your, your tidal volume is, is reduced as well. Uh, so the way that you typically compensate for that is you have somebody with emphysema, they can't bring very much new air into the lungs because the old air refuses to leave, right? You can't bring very much new air in. So the new air that you bring in with each diminished breath should contain more oxygen, which is what they do with somebody that has emphysema. So you see these people who are going around, they have these little tubes that go that that go underneath their nose and those little tubes are either connected to an oxygen tank or to a machine. The machine is the oxygen tank is full of oxygen. So you know what that is. And the machine is an oxygen concentrator. So what it does is it's a machine that takes the oxygen out of the air and concentrates it. So that instead of having 20% oxygen in the air, you have 40% or something like that. So it's better to inhale air that contains 40% if you have a diminished capacity, the diminished lung capacity. Uh, but the problem is there are various tricks that you can do. I mean, you could, you could give somebody who has emphysema, you could let them breathe pure oxygen. Uh, uh, emphysema is usually lethal. It will, it will usually kill you and it's a very unpleasant death. Um, it's an unpleasant death because you feel like you're drowning, you're suffocating, you can't you can't get enough air when you breathe. That's those are the symptoms of emphysema, and uh, you can you can get as much pure oxygen into the lungs if you want. So at, at, and the terminal phases of emphysema, that means towards the end, just as you're starting to die, they will typically put somebody who has emphysema on pure oxygen. So they're breathing in pure oxygen. But that, that alone wouldn't save you. The problem is the buildup of carbon dioxide in the blood. So you can't get the carbon dioxide out, right? So that's the main problem. So um, uh, if you have a buildup of carbon dioxide in the blood, you'll eventually pass out because you, you know, it causes you to black out and die. But the first stages of carbon dioxide poisoning are paranoia. So unfortunately, somebody who's who's getting close to dying due to emphysema will sometimes become kind of paranoid uh, and think everyone's out to get them, and they'll have delusions, delusion, scary delusions that people are out to get them, and it's a very very unpleasant thing to watch. All right, so infantile respiratory distress syndrome, baby can't make premature infant, uh, premature neonate is the neonate is the technical term for a baby neo. N-E-O-N-A-T-E, -E, neonate. Um, they, you fix this issue with a respirator. Chronic bronchitis. So the bronchial tubes are normally, the trachea and the bronchial tubes are normally uh, surrounded with a thin layer of mucus that's produced by this layer here of columnar epithelium. If those columnar epithelia that line the inside of the trachea become swollen and start producing lots of mucus, you end up with a diminished capacity to breathe because the diameter, the, the, the diameter of your trachea is smaller. And then you're constantly coughing out, constantly coughing out the mucus Right? And then you wear a vest at night to shake loose the mucus so you can cough some more of it out. You have inhalers that, that uh, reduce the inflammation. Uh, there are drugs called steroids. You know what a steroid hormone is. Steroid hormones, one of the things that they have the ability to do is to reduce inflammation. So people who have chronic bronchitis or even asthma, they inhale steroids 
and the steroids have the ability to 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 reduce swelling in various swelling tissues so sometimes you know we talked earlier about carpal tunnel syndrome people will take uh, steroid hormones to treat carpal tunnel syndrome because the steroids have the ability to, to to reduce the swelling in the wrist in the carpal tunnel and therefore the nerve the medial nerve that runs through the carpal tunnel will not be pinched anymore okay emphysema Okay, so instead of having stretchy, nice stretchy elastic tissue in the lungs, the tissue becomes damaged due to the hot smoke and so it doesn't recoil anymore. So, the, so you can breathe in new air, but the stale old air refuses to leave. The stale old air will not go back out because the elastic recoil has been damaged. This is caused by cigarette smoking. Right now, I don't, I don't use this term lightly, but cigarette manufacturing and tobacco manufacturing is an evil business because we know for a fact, we know it's not a, it's not a theory, it's an indisputed fact that number one, cigarette smoking is addictive, right? So you're addicting people to doing this. Right? Uh, nicotine in cigarettes in tobacco is addictive. So once you've started smoking, it's very difficult to stop. It's an addictive drug. And we know that it causes lung cancer because nicotine is also something called a mutagen. A mutagen is something that mutates genes. And if you mutate genes, you stand a good chance of converting them into cancer cells, right? So it is a fact that cigarette smoking, inhaling nicotine will cause lung cancer. If you, if you didn't get lung cancer, if you smoked all your life and you didn't get lung cancer, it was just luck. The odds are that, you know, you're, uh, you are deliberately mutating the cells in, inside your lungs and eventually you'll get lung cancer. Right? So that's a fact. It's an indisputable fact. And furthermore, uh, another indisputable fact is that cigarette smoking causes emphysema, which is a very, both lung cancer and emphysema are very unpleasant ways to die. Right? So cigarette manufacturing and tobacco manufacturing is an evil business because the people who do it are, are making money, knowingly making money by causing other people misery. Right, so uh, I don't say that lightly, but it's the truth. And cigarette smoking should be, cigarette manufacturing should be illegal for the same reason that uh, other addictive drugs like crack cocaine and, and heroin are illegal uh, because people are making money by inflicting misery on other people. Okay, so, um, this is one of the things that we go through in history. You know, why is it not illegal when it should be? The reason is because the companies that do this employ people and they pay some taxes and they, they take some of the money that they make from selling this evil drug. They take some of that money and they donate it to the political campaigns of politicians and say, well, if you don't support our industry, then next time we'll give it to your opponent. And so you better support our industry. Uh, in North America, that's referred to as lobbying. Lobbying means, literally means uh, various special interest gr groups go to politicians and donate money and then say, if you don't do what we want, we'll withdraw the money next time and give it to your opponent. Right? So then the politicians want to keep their jobs. And so that's called lobbying. Uh, I call it corruption. <laughs> uh, but, it is, but to make it seem less foul and unpleasant, it is sometimes referred to as lobbying. Right, where you have special interest groups that, that basically extort politicians into doing what they want. So that's the reason why this evil business persists. And it causes millions of people every year to die all over the world, to die in misery. Okay, and uh, this is a, just an interesting picture here. This photograph in the in the 90s, in the early 90s, um, the United States Congress called the CEOs of all of the tobacco companies to testify before Congress. And they all put up their hand and swore an oath that they would tell the truth. And then the United States congressman asked them if cigarette smoking was addictive and they every one of them lied and said, no, it's not. But it, in fact, we know for a fact, and we've known for decades and decades that cigarette smoking and tobacco is an addictive drug. Okay, so uh, if you ever are in a position, if you ever get into politics or public policy or something like that, you should be aware of this and you should probably try to work to, to end this practice because it not only does it kill people and causes them to die in agony, but, but it also causes, it puts a tremendous strain on our healthcare system, which everybody pays for.
So uh, in order to, to kind of equivocate and to, to, to practice cognitive dissonance, I told you equivocation, cognitive dissonance is something that uh, you do when you, you're doing something that's evil and, and you're doing something that's wrong and you know it's wrong, but you try to convince yourself that you're doing the wrong thing for the right reason or there's some, there's some good reason to do it as well. That's called, that's called cognitive dissonance. And the cognitive dissonance that uh, the government of Canada and most other countries do practice is the idea that, well, this is a this is an evil business, and they, they do cause people to die, and it causes our healthcare system to lose a lot of money. But we are employing people; those companies are employing people. Um, and uh, you know, if we feel really guilty about it, instead of banning cigarettes, why don't we just increase the taxes on cigarettes to discourage people from smoking? Right. So we haven't banned it outright; we've just put a tremendously high tax on cigarettes. Well, you know, if you are addicted to it, you will pay anything. And right? if you're addicted to tobacco or any other form of addictive drug, you will, it doesn't matter, you will pay anything. So putting a tax on cigarettes in order to, in theory, to, to, to discourage people from uh, using it is you're, you're only fooling yourself. That's cognitive dissonance cognitive dissonance rather. Okay, so now oxygen transport in the blood. As I said, oxygen is required. Oxygen is required by the mitochondria in order to convert glucose into ATP. So oxygen is needed for a stage in that reaction that's called the ETC or electron transport chain. And there's another phase or another part of the reactions that take place in the mitochondria that are referred to as the Krebs cycle. If you take biology 120 uh, or or biochemistry 201, we get into more detail about the, the series of reactions that are called the Krebs cycle. But for now, just remember that the Krebs cycle produces carbon dioxide as a waste product. So as a result of that, whenever, whenever our body is generating energy, we have the mitochondria need oxygen and produce carbon dioxide as a waste product. So in order to get oxygen to every cell which is needed in every cell you know every cell has mitochondria every cell needs to the mito for their mitochondria to convert glucose into ATP to generate energy so we have to get oxygen to every cell so the bloodstream takes oxygen at the lungs takes oxygen out of the air puts it into the into the blood at a concentration of around 20 percent or something like that and then it becomes attached to a protein that's located in red blood cells called hemoglobin Okay, now the the hemoglobin is uh, hemoglobin is uh, has a has an iron ion as a cofactor, and the oxygen sticks to the iron at high pH. The, the pH of the blood is fairly high at the lungs. Right? Okay, now carbon dioxide is a waste product that we that the cells kick out and throw into the blood. The carbon dioxide gas is converted into a liquid car called carbonic acid. And because it has the word acid in it, you know that the effect of dissolving carbon dioxide in the blood and turning carbon dioxide into carbonic acid has the effect of lowering the pH of the blood. All right. So the result of that is that hemoglobin in the blood, in the red blood cells, hemoglobin will hold on, will grab on to oxygen and carry it. Uh, you know, as long as the pH is 7.4 or something like that, it will carry it to remote parts of the body. If a particular part of the body is using a lot of energy, it's, it's going to be producing a lot of carbon dioxide because carbon dioxide is a waste product that the mitochondria throw out. Okay, so if you have a part of the body, let, let's say you're going for a run and the leg muscles are working very hard, that means that they're consuming a lot of oxygen and they're producing a lot of carbon dioxide. The, the hemoglobin will circulate to that area, and when it reaches an area where there's a lot of carbon dioxide in the blood and the pH is lower, it will let go of the oxygen that it's carrying, won't it? Right. So, so the, the areas of the body that, that are working hard and producing carbon dioxide, will, they will have, those areas of the body will have a lower pH. And when the blood, when the hemoglobin carrying the oxygen comes to one of those places of the parts of the body, it will let go of the oxygen which is perfect, right? Because that's the part of the body that needs it the most. So uh, hemoglobin will hold on to oxygen at high pH, typically 7.4. Uh, 
and we'll let go of the oxygen at low pH, typically 7.2 or somewhere in there, right? So hemoglobin will hold on to oxygen at pH 7.4 and we'll release it at 7.2. So the pH of human blood fluctuates somewhere between 7.2 and 7.4. It's 7.2 in areas of the body that are working hard and producing a lot of carbon dioxide. And it tends to be high in areas of the body that are near the lungs, for instance, right? So that is the trick that, carb that uh, hemoglobin uses to carry oxygen. Okay, so oxygen is carried by a protein called hemoglobin. This is present in the red blood cells. The technical term for red blood cells is erythrocyte. Uh, erythro is a Greek word for red, meaning red. Right? So oxygen is carried by hemoglobin. If cells are working hard, they'll produce lots of CO2 as a waste product. The CO2 will dissolve in the blood and form bicarbonate. And then there's an enzyme, there's an enzyme called car carbonic anhydrase so that converts carbon dioxide into bicarbonate and carbonic acid. So the human blood contains a mixture of carbonic, uh, bicarbonate and, and carbonic acid. Right, so here we have red blood cells also known as erythrocytes. And here we have hemoglobin. Here's a hemoglobin molecule. And these red things are meant to be oxygen. They're red because, you know, when blood is, when you have oxygenated blood, the blood is in contact with oxygen, it is red. And then these things here are heme groups, called heme groups, which contain an iron ion. And that's what's holding on to the oxygen, provided that the pH is high, like 7.4 or something. So when we were talking about chemical solutions, aqueous solutions on the, in the laboratory, we were, dis, we were defining high pH as 8 and low pH as 2. But when we're talking about the human blood, we mean when, when I say high, I mean 7.4. When I say low, I mean 7.2. Like there's a very small difference between the, the pH at which hemoglobin will carry oxygen versus letting it go. Okay, now here's something that, that might be useful for you to know. Carbon monoxide is a compound that's produced by the combustion engine, and it is a deadly poison because oxygen will bind reversibly to the hemoglobin, right? So that means oxygen binds to hemoglobin at high pH, 7.4, and will come off at low pH, 7.2. Carbon monoxide will bind to the hemoglobin molecule at either pH and it will never come off, right? So you say that carbon monoxide, we say that carbon monoxide will irreversibly bind to hemoglobin. It will irreversibly bind to hemoglobin, right? So carbon dioxide binds irreversibly. That means that if you inhale carbon monoxide, your blood will lose the ability to carry oxygen. Right. So uh, sometimes people commit suicide that way. You know, you've heard of this method of committing suicide where you, you lock yourself in your garage and you turn on the, the automobile engine and you inhale carbon monoxide until you're dead. Basically, what you did is you caused yourself to suffocate to death because, the, because carbon monoxide binds irreversibly to hemoglobin. Okay, so remember that's why carbon monoxide, not carbon dioxide, but carbon monoxide is a poison. It's a deadly poison. Okay, so we mentioned the fact that there's an enzyme called carbonic anhydrase. Carbonic anhydrase has the effect of combining carbon dioxide gas and water to produce carbonic acid and bicarbonate. Right? And so you know, some of you may know, some of you may not, but if you have an acid and a conjugate base, right? So this is an acid and this is a base that are both derived from the same molecule. That is a buffering system, right? So if you want the pH to be low, then you shift from the bicarbonate to the carbonic acid. So you have more carbonic acid than bicarbonate. If you want the pH to go up, then you shift from carbonic acid to bicarbonate so that you have more bicarbonate than carbonic acid. That's called a buffering system that goes that can regulate the, P, the pH of a solution depending on how much is in this form versus the other form. Right? So this, that was what I meant at the beginning of the course when I said that uh, the, the uh, human blood is buffered by uh, one buffer that's called phosphate buffer and by another buffer that's called the carbonic acid bicarbonate buffer. Okay, so and the fact that the blood is buffered by carbonic acid is handy because if the pH is low due to a lot of carbonic acid, 
the hemoglobin will release the oxygen at that area versus grabbing onto it at another area where the amount of bicarbonate is higher than the amount of carbonic acid. Now, what about, you know, when you're inhaling, you're inhaling and exhaling, sometimes you take deep breaths, but you notice that you tend, when you get nervous, you tend to take shallow breaths, right? That's, that's uh, the depth of your breathing. The amount of air that you suck into your lungs is controlled by a structure in the brain called the medulla oblongata. The medulla oblongata. Right? Now, the medulla oblongata depends on how deeply you should be breathing based on the pH of the blood. Right? It's based on the pH of the blood. So uh, typically, if the pH of the blood is too low, the medulla oblongata will cause your lungs to start taking to slow down, take slower breaths and take deeper breaths, which has the effect of getting it does a better job of getting rid of the carbon dioxide from the lungs and getting fresh oxygen into the lungs. Right? So a low pH the medulla oblongata is able to sense the pH of the blood, and if the pH is too low, it will cause your lungs to take deeper, slower breaths. That's something the medulla oblongata does. And it is cueing on the pH of the blood. It determines how deep, deeply you should be breathing based on the pH of the blood. Okay, so the pH of your blood and your breathing rate, the depth of breathing and the, the respiration rate, is, the, is controlled homeostatically, isn't it? So the hemostatic, hemi, homeostatic, sorry, the homeostatic set point for the blood is pH 7.4. If the pH of the blood goes down to 7.2, the medulla oblongata gets busy and causes you to take deeper breaths, which brings the pH back up again. So here we have another example, the pH of the blood being controlled by the medulla oblongata and the, and the respiratory system, controlling the pH of the blood to ideally be somewhere around 7.4. But it will, the pH of the blood will be lower in parts of the body where there is more carbon dioxide being produced because the cells are working harder. Okay, so let's have a look here. If the, if the blood becomes too acidic, the medulla oblongata causes you to take deeper breaths and then you look you get rid of a lot of the carbon dioxide from the blood and then the ph goes goes back up again right so that's the way the ph of the blood is controlled through homeostasis with the help of the medulla oblongata all right so have you ever seen this cure for hyperventilation hyperventilation is when you get nervous and you and you start breathing rapidly and shallowly Okay, somebody cures that by getting you to breathe into a bag for a minute or so, right? You don't want to breathe into the bag indefinitely, but just for, you know, a minute or so, you breathe into a bag and that will slow down the breathing rate. Now, in the hospital, they have a fancy airbag that fits over your nose and your mouth, and it's called a rebreather. But it's, the principle is the same. You're rebreathing the air that you just exhaled. Okay, so how do you think that a rebreather would slow down your rate of breathing. How do you, why do you think that breathing into a paper bag and in re-inhaling the air that you just exhaled, how would, how would that cause you to start breathing more deeply and more slowly? So just think, you, when you exhale, you send out a bunch of carbon dioxide and then you breathe that same carbon dioxide back in again. So what effect would that have? That would have the effect of lowering the pH of the blood and that would have the effect of the medulla oblongata sending signals to the lungs telling you to take deeper, slower breaths, right? So then once, you, once your breathing slows down, you take the bag away because the, you know, if you start breathing too much carbon dioxide for a long period of time, you'll start out by getting paranoid and then you'll pass out, right? So you don't want to breathe the carbon dioxide, the rebreathe the carbon dioxide too long, but just for a minute, that would be okay. And that usually slows down the rate of respiration and you start taking deeper, uh, deeper, uh, shorter, uh, deeper, fuller, longer breaths. Okay, so to summarize what we talked about for this 
this class or this particular lecture, we talked about a contrast between the way humans breathe and the way other animals breathe. Then we moved on to a discussion of the different parts that constitute the human respiratory system, the intercostal muscles, the trachea, the alveoli, the terminal bronchioles, and so on. Then we discussed how we quantify or put numbers to the various volumes of air that go in and out of our lungs as a result of normal breathing, which is called just tidal breathing, versus the vital capacity and so on. And we discussed some of the lung capacities, including the infantile respiratory distress syndrome, emphysema, chronic bronchitis, and so on. And we talked about how oxygen is transported by by hemoglobin in the blood. The hemoglobin is present inside red blood cells called erythrocytes. And uh, hemoglobin will hold on to oxygen. It will grab oxygen and pick it up at high pH and will release it at low pH. You typically find low pHs in part of the parts of the body that are working hard and thus producing a lot of carbon dioxide as a waste product. So this is the ideal method for transporting oxygen around the body and then releasing it in the areas where it is needed most because those areas are producing the most carbon dioxide and therefore have the lowest pH in the blood that surrounds those areas. All right, so I believe our next lecture is on the circulatory system. The, the car, I'm sorry, the cardiovascular and circulatory system. So I'll see you there.